I think we're at the stage where we've got to go ahead with implementation. But I think the other area of research that we'll get involved into, at least to some extent, is that, okay, we're talking so far about the problem of a high prevalence of myopia. The other problem that we need to talk about is the high prevalence of high myopia. Now, what this seems to come from is early onset myopia. I don't mean early onset like two or three. That's almost certainly genetic. I'm talking about kids who become myopic in the early years of primary school, where there's arguably a strong environmental component. And these kids progress fast. Yeah, you know, progression declines with age. So if you become myopic at the age of six, you progress, yeah, you know, maybe up till your early 20s and you start with a higher rate. Uh, and so what's happening in East Asia seems to be that the children who become myopic at the age of six or seven or eight can progress to high myopia quite naturally. <clears throat> if we can hold myopia off until the they go to high school, the chances of them progressing to high myopia is much, much reduced. The other thing we can do, and there are now a variety of techniques for uh, uh, doing this, is to slow the rate of progression. And there's a whole range of things that clinicians can do there. These range from uh, contact lenses and spectacles that uh, are claimed to slow progression. I use the word claim there. I think the evidence for some forms is pretty clear. For other forms, it's not so good. And I think uh, uh, clinicians look, need to look very closely at the underlying literature of what works and doesn't work. In addition, we've now got low dose atropine, which is being increasingly used by uh, ophthalmologists. Uh, to control progression. And so there's a whole lot of things that we could do. Let's take China, for example. By the age, by third year of primary school, 30 to 40 percent of children have become myopic. If you were to target that group and use systematic myopia prevention approaches, early detection, rapid referral to clinicians, use of the best uh, approaches, we could almost abolish the problem of increased high myopia. Now, there are genetic forms of high myopia, but they're pretty rare. That's at the most 1% of the population. You could get rid of most of it, and hopefully the potential pathology that arises from that with the, with the techniques that we currently have. But you need systematic development in a country like China, you do it strongly through the school system because you know that the outcome is 90% of kids will become myopic. In the case of Australia, it's much more likely to be done through uh, clinical interventions. That's, that's, there's, there's no problem with that. There are just a whole range of devices now approaches that can be used to control progression. One that I'm particularly impressed by is the uh, contact lenses and spectacles that have been developed at uh, PolyU in Hong Kong. Uh, these seem to be capable of uh, slowing progression by about 60 uh, to 70 percent. And once again, that will largely eliminate the high myopia problem, not, not completely because of the genetic cases, but uh, very significantly. And of course, particularly their, uh, their myopic defocus spectacles uh, uh, yeah, are about as non-invasive as you can get. Compared to uh, putting atropine drops in the eye, they're <laughs> a long way ahead. Compared to orthokeratology, they're, they're a long way ahead, although some parents will always prefer, prefer something like orthokeratology 
for sort of convenience and cosmetic reasons. The paper is really to try and explain to people why there has been this massive change. Yeah, the twin studies look very convincing, but they only generate a hypothesis. And when you start critically testing that hypothesis, it significantly starts to fall apart. The place where we are now is that on the sort of, on a conservative estimation, the genetic discoveries probably account for 1% of very genetic myopia and may account for certainly less than 10% of variance in refraction in non-genetic cases. If you use a different approach to genetics, not GWAS testing as such, but what's called SNP or SNP heritability, which ignores some issues of statistical significance, you can get the percent explanation of variance in refractive error up to 25, 35%. Now, the problem is when you've got such a low level of heritability, always compare it to the sort of 80 to 90 percent in twin studies. When the heritability is that slow, it sets limits to prediction. And basically at that level, prediction is not very useful on a genetic basis. Similarly, these genetic studies have not yet identified pathways that link clearly to uh, some of the things that are already clinically available. Let's take atropine, for example, which is believed to act uh, by modulating the dopaminergic system. Let's take time outdoors. There's very little in the genetic studies that uh, are, is telling us anything new. So a recent paper in Nature on yeah, genetic definition of pathways says, well, it's telling us that light activated processes are important. Well, I'm sorry, but we've known about that for 20 to 30 years. I think it's unlikely that we will see significant breakthroughs in our understanding of myopia through the GWAS pathway that's being pursued. A better potential for genetic understanding comes from looking at these 200 odd different forms of very clearly Mendelian genetic myopias. If we can look at those, we may be able to work out specific pathways for some of these. And then we can say, develop something like personalized medicine. We can say, well, you have this kind of mutation, so we can do the following. But a lot of our understanding of that will become uh, uh, come just from looking at the, at the parents in reality. If you've got two parents with uh, Marfan syndrome and you have a child with Marfan syndrome, well, you know what you're dealing with.